question is, how did you meet your wife? Well, we went to a birthday party in Batavia, Illinois. Joe Peterman had a birthday, so uh, I invited a young lady to go with me. We went to the birthday party. He was standing around the piano singing. And somebody came up from behind me, and I turned around and said, I don't like anybody standing behind me like <laughs> this. Well, so happened that was Charlene. That's how I met her. Mm -hmm. And so I met her at a friend's birthday party. And, uh, and then uh, we went to the church, the storefront building, uh, Joe Peterman and his friend, and she came with them to the, birth, uh, to the church at, uh, at the storefront. Mm -hmm. And I asked her if I could carry her home. Now, one of those men that was with Joe, she said, you go get hit before you get home. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, what do you mean by carry? <laughs> she said, what do you mean? That was my terminology. And so then I got, I used my brother-in-law's car, and she said, they're going to follow me. I said, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Well, what I didn't know, she was very afraid of fast driving. And I can understand, she had a brother killed in an accident. But she didn't tell me that. <laughs> and so these guys started following me. I said, no problem. I lost them completely to oh. St. Charles. And, uh, and so that's how we met. Now, she was scared to death in that car. But she wouldn't say a word. I wouldn't have drove fast had I known. But that's how we met, and that's how things started out. And, and from there, it uh, kept going. <laughs> All right. So the second question is, is it true your wife has had a parrot, a monkey, and a skunk as pets? Yes. Now, she had the skunk when I was in the military. Now, why in the world she had the skunk, uh, you have to ask her. Uh, <laughs> And the, the squirrel was a, a pet squirrel, and uh, I was home when we did that. And, and that little squirrel would climb up the window shade, the cords on the window shades that we get under the bed. You try to find him one day, it caught a hook to the springs under the bed, bed was where you couldn't see him. He was a mess, but and he would. We taught him. She put a diaper on him. We taught him to walk with us. Well, I've, I was walking along, it felt kind of heavy. I looked down, and he was just holding it, holding it up there, and I was carrying it. <laughs> so, he wasn't walking at so, all. Uh, so that was the experience, and a, and a skunk was when I was in the military. Mm -hmm. And what was the other thing? A parrot. Yes. Now, the parrot could speak real well. We were at home here, at, uh, and uh, somebody came in the door on a Saturday morning. I heard somebody, I walked to the living room, somebody said, hello, hello, hello. And it was Sister Valma Howard. She said, well, you, your wife invited me in. Well, what had happened was the, the wood doors was open and uh, their parent, when she said hello, the parent said, come in, come in, come in, come in. <laughs> so she came in. That parent could speak so plain that you couldn't tell it. For example, when Brent was a little guy, I don't know how old he would have been back then, maybe eight, ten, I don't know. Uh, we're going somewhere, and I said, Brent, go get in the car. And so I'm talking to the wife, and I said, Brent, go get in the car. And something says, says, really smart, what? I said, I'll watch you. <laughs> I got my belt off, headed back to his room. And the wife says, Brent's waiting for you in the car. <laughs> So he got saved by it, but that dog, that parrot could talk so plain. Uh, and so uh, people would come and sing, like Brother Ed Chester, that group, group from the Bible College mm -hmm. in, in St. Louis. Uh, they'd come and sing and play the piano downstairs, and that uh, bird liked it, and she'd mock them playing the piano. <laughs> and to this day, they'll tell you that they remember the parrot, don't remember much about me. But, uh, <laughs> That's yes. So All right. What is your earliest memory of going to church? I can't remember when I didn't go to church. Mm -hmm. My earliest memory is we went in a mules and wagon. Mm -hmm. We had a fancy seat that you sat on the wagon. They called it a spring seat mm -hmm. where mother would sit and daddy would sit. And I was a little guy, so I sat in between them. Now, my other brothers had to sit in the back of the wagon. and uh, But then they would get, they got a little pride in their and them, and so they came when uh, they'd hear a car coming, they'd jump out of the wagon and start walking. Uh. And the car get by, they'd get back in the wagon. 
Bob and Dad said, they said they, they didn't want to ride the wagon. Dad said, that's fine, you can walk all the way if you want to. <laughs> but uh, yes, that was my earliest remembrance of going to church. It was a church way out of the country. We lived out in the country. It was a church way out of the country. And at the bottom of the hill was a steep hill. The church was there, and when it rained real hard, uh, the only one that had a car was our pastor, Brother Autry. Mm -hmm. uh, and he couldn't make it up that hill for all the mud and stuff. When he rained, so we'd hook our mules and wagon on Jerry and Rock mm -hmm. uh, to his car and pull him to the top of the hill, and he'd go on home. So that's my first memories of church. Wow. So that was what, that's one of your favorite mules that you had, right, Jerry? Yes, I've got his collar now. Yeah. His collar is, I've got his collar and his gear to remind me of him. That's the first mule I'll ever plow. What is the most important thing that your mother taught you? She taught me to respect. And she mm -hmm. taught me to respect, first of all, God, and respect people. And mother taught us to be honest. Every night before we'd go to bed, she'd, we didn't have electricity. We had uh, kerosene lights, and they had one that was a brighter light. They called it a lead lamp. Kind of mm -hmm. works like a gas lamp with a wick in it. And she'd gather all of us children around and read us a Bible stories before we went to bed. But she taught us respect, God first of all, and other people. That's awesome. Taught us memorization. We had, she taught Sunday school ever since I can remember, over 50 years. Mm -hmm. They had got to the place she couldn't make it up the stairs in the church there in Giobbe where Brother Bishop pastor, Brother Raymond Bishop, the now son, Brother Mark Bishop. And they had a Sunday school class upstairs and moved it downstairs, as I recall, where Bob could still teach. Wow, that's awesome. What is the most important thing that your father taught you? Honesty. Dad was a man of great honesty. Uh, he was not, he was a man of a few words and he uh, had a short fuse to his temper. Uh, but honesty, we could do lots of things. I remember. Sometimes we'd have to have, uh, for extra money, sell a little corn. We were cotton farmers, that's how we made our money crop. Mm -hmm. But running slow, we'd uh, sometimes have to have a little extra money, so he'd sell some corn, we'd put it in a bushel basket, and take it down town to sell it. I remember we'd get that full, and Dad would say, boys, did you shake it down? I said, what do you mean, Daddy? He said, shake it down, because he had read it in the Bible where it talks about, give them good measure, shake it down and run it over. He took the scripture out of his context, but he believed that. And he said, give people a good measure. And so dad taught us honesty. Somebody tried to get him to enter his mule, Jerry and Rock, in a pulling contest at the fairgrounds in Glenfield. Fairgrounds, near your opening. Uh, there was a man that had a couple of horses and been winning it every year, and they behind the scenes would gamble on those things. And Daddy, they came to Daddy and paid him, offered him this, I remember, $500 if he'd entered his mules in that contest. Daddy said, no way. He said, I don't, my mules make me a living. We plow the, the crop, crops in the summertime, and I log in the wintertime with them, and when I call on them to do something, I expect them to do it. I am not going to hook them up to something just to see how much they can pull where you guys could make so much money. Oh, we won't. They promised Daddy they would, but Daddy knew better. So he turned down $500. He said, I will not enter my mules into that pulling contest. Now they have a contest at the fairs, I understand it, like sandwich fair guns. They pull tractors, pull stuff. Mm -hmm. It was mules back in those days. About how much money was $500 now? Oh, I have no idea. $500, in, in, uh, I was born in 37, so this would have been probably around the 50, 1950, around that time. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's astronomical, unbelievable. And we didn't have money. Mm -hmm. We raised our own food. We had plenty to eat. We slaughtered four, four hogs a year and one beef. Uh, we had a big garden, so we, we were blessed. Uh, but as far as money we didn't have, and to put that kind of money and offer to somebody, but Daddy believed in honesty. He taught us honesty. He said, don't ever get to the place that you can't look everybody in the eye, eye when you see them, but be honest. Yeah. I got one other story on that. 
I bought me a motor scooter. It's a Sears and Roebuck motor scooter, Craftsman, and it, I mean, it was, it was wore out. Mm -hmm. I was about 15, and the person sold it to me, over 20 years old. I, I traded a good, good pocket knife and a good shotgun for it. It got home, the thing is July weather, tried to start it, couldn't start it. Daddy said to me, said, son, you got tuck. But I made one of the worst mistakes I ever made to dad because I talked about his honesty. I said, but daddy, I'm not 21, I can make him trade back. And did I get a tongue lashing? <laughs> he said, if you're not as good as your word, you're not worth the salt in your bread. Just let it be a lesson to you. You told the man, you, do, you traded that away, you made the deal. Just be more careful on my own, but don't ever try to go back on your word. Yeah. That's your last I love that. Um, the next question is, everyone has times of frustration and disappointment and anxiety. It can be difficult to talk about when you're in it, but after you go through it, it's easier to talk about. Do you mind talking about some of these times? And so these are some of the questions. What was it like to be drafted into the war? Well, when I was drafted into the military, uh, I was uh, a year earlier, I went into Chicago. I was registered in Union County, in New York, to Mississippi. I was just looking at my papers a few minutes ago. Uh, <clears throat> but I lived in Illinois, and so we went in from Chicago. And as I went into the, from Chicago, uh, uh, and uh, get on that troop trade. You know, that is just a bunch of people going there. I thought about how lonely it was to be away from home and not know whether I was going to make it back or not, not know what was in store for us. But uh, it got to it, it helped me. We went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for a few weeks and then Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And uh, I remember when we were out there a while, the wife moved out there and we lived off post on a Christmas Eve. When our oldest son was born that in January the 10th, on a Christmas Eve, we went up to Mount Rainier, which is about 40 or $50, uh, 50 miles from there, and we fed the deer they were out of candy and they'd come and eat out of our hands. That was a lonely time, just Charlene and I, nobody else, no family. But I thought it, through it all, it made me go closer to God. I felt closer to God. Mm -hmm. And then... These are just a list of things and you can go through and sit, like pick out what you'd want to talk about, but it's lists um, being unexpected call, unexpectedly called to go to Vietnam and then parenting young children, parenting teenagers, parenting adults now, mm -hmm. and then being a grandfather. Well, I think growing with the age, I've always said live within the age that you are. No, don't live, try to live 20 years older than what you are, 20 years younger because you have those days that develops you and you learn. Uh, I learned from my parents' obedience. Uh, it was never a question. Uh, I learned the, the obedience, but to respect people. And was uh, uh, in children, in raising children, to try to understand where they were coming from. Uh, why did they feel the way they felt? I wanted them to know that we loved them, cared about them, but uh, there are certain standards we would not compromise. And so I think that's all ages. And you grow with them, and you, uh, you learn to give them privileges as they earn their privileges. Uh, I remember we'd set curfews, and a certain time you'd be in, and they had to be in that curfew. Not, and it, so you're just teaching them discipline. And so with, with uh, I think relationships is key. Don't hold grudges. When you have a disagreement, whether it be with an adult or with your children, if you see you made a mistake, and we always parents do, if you see you came too harsh, uh, then be man enough or woman enough to go back to that child when you're not angry and make it right. I recall uh, one of my boys uh, would, uh, had some things that he come in, he, something they was wanting him to do at school, his friends was wanting to do that I just felt like I couldn't allow him to do as a Christian. I remember waking up at midnight on a Friday night because that was his curfew. Mm -hmm. And he came in at midnight, maybe about five minutes till. I was still up praying and just weeping because I hated to tell my son he couldn't do it. Other people were allowed their children to do it. 
but we did God. I just couldn't do it. I went to school and watched that activity practiced during the daytime, and I felt the spirit, the attitude of it. So I didn't do it without thinking about it. And so I felt it, it, it felt it was just so hard for me. So the, so the next morning, and then the, the boy handled it real good. It happened to be bread, in fact. He held it real good. And then the next morning, I went down and, and knelt by his bed, and I said, son, I hate it because I can't let you do that. I said, but I just can't. And he said, dad, don't worry about it. He trusted me, trusted my judgment. And so you learn in raising the children, be honest with them, be honest with them. But if you make a mistake, let them know. I recall at the church, for instance, uh, on one Wednesday night, there were some housekeeping things that needed to be done. So after Bible study, right before we dismissed, I talked about them. I was very strong in talking about them. Well, when I, on my way home, God began to talk to me because I realized my spirit, my attitude was wrong. What I said was right. And so I'm into the bedroom here, getting ready for bed. Our bathroom was off the master's bedroom. And to my dear wife, Charlene, said, Bill, that didn't sound like you tonight. I said, what are you talking about? I was hoping she wasn't talking about what I was thinking about. Because <laughs> God had already worked me over that. I asked God's forgiveness already. Uh, and instead of just telling me, come out saying what it is, I said, what do you mean? She said, you know what I mean. <laughs> well, I didn't know what, I, what she meant. But what I did with that is uh, next Wednesday night in the same setting, right before we dismissed, uh, I talked about the housekeeping. I said, what I said was right, and it still goes, but I want you to forgive me because I was in the wrong attitude, my spirit, I was upset, I let my emotions get the best of me. Uh, I did that because I felt like God required me to do that. Now, God don't always require that. There's a man come up to me who became a minister later, said, I can't thank you enough for being open and honest. Uh, we make mistakes. We can do one or two things. We can repeat that mistake, or we can learn from that mistake. And that made me more careful uh, after that. But if you do something wrong, make it right. Mm -hmm. So honesty. One other thing, and I have to be careful here. I can get on a tantrum. Uh, I had a person at work. I worked at Western Electric in Montgomery, Illinois. And we had about 40 people worked with us from about 18 years old to about 25, 26 years old. Uh, there was an inspector that kept pushing me. I was, uh, I was checking the materials before it would go to the inspector because we was having some quality problems. And I spent about 12 hours on a four-poster truck checking some stuff. And this guy had been, this inspector had a lousy uh, attitude, had a dirty mouth, filthy, uh, I can't say all what he was. Uh, he came up to me, was working overtime, 12 hour days. And so he just took his foot and flipped one of those relays and I just went through strip of them, which re re represented many, much work. And he laughed, he said, he called Billy Joe, oh, what if there's any defects in that? Would well, be full of defects, because they flipped it out of the tray onto the floor. So the way he came up with me, I from Mississippi, and so they named me Billy Joe as a nickname because Billy Joe jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge, which is there in Mississippi. Uh, I r turned around from that table and I caught, I almost hit him. I turned around from the table and got a hold to his collar with my left hand and God helped me stop. And I, and I just went to the boss and I'm going home. He said, why? I said, well, I just about lost it. And, I, and so I, I couldn't even make it home. I'm talking about making things right. We all make mistakes, but do we try to cover them up or do we make them honest before God and that person? Uh, I got on the way home, and those that lived in the Aurora at that time will remember that there was a place where Art Newquist's Pitt Pontiac was, and there was a pay telephone booth for the corner. I couldn't make it home. I lived in St. Charles at the time. I pulled off the road, went in that phone booth and called and asked for or I'll just I say his name, Kitty. I won't say his last name. As for Kitty, and he came to the telephone. I said, I got to ask your forgiveness for what I did. And he said, Billy Cho, he said, I thought these guys were going to put a rope around my neck and hang me from the ceiling. He said, They know I've been pushing you for three weeks, three months. 
I've been trying to get push you three months, and I thought, I made it, I said, but I'm a Christian. I still should have lost it. Forgive me. And then after that, we became the best of friends. <laughs> when he'd have somebody at friends the hospital, he asked me if I go visit him. Fuel, he had to ask me to do some funeral services for his friends. But what was bad, God turned it into something good, mm -hmm. which reminds me of Joseph being sold into bondage. His brothers did the wrong thing, but Joseph didn't look at it from that point of view. He looked at us. God was preparing him for the ultimate place he was going to use him. And I think that was one of the trials of my growth pattern that God was helping me grow and uh, what was my weakness. I had a terrible temper. I'd have to pray and fast to keep it under control. What was my weakness became my strength because God was preparing me for a greater work. I'm not comparing myself to a Joseph, but God, uh, we see in Joseph what all he went through where he would be prepared and he didn't have grudge against his brothers when they did uh, come by my court in Egypt. So just be up straight. My dad, great man, uh, taught me honesty, and he said, nobody's smart enough to be a good liar. He said, they'll forget what they told somebody. Mm -hmm. Just be honest and you don't have to hide nothing. Yeah. That's really good. There's only one more question that I have to ask is, what have you learned as you have grown older what challenges have you faced in your body, mind, and spirit? So, like physical challenges, mental or spiritual challenges that... I've had to learn that I can't always do everything like I want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, my philosophy is, was, my philosophy was, if it don't go the first time, if you can't get it to go, get a bigger hammer. <laughs> but that's not God's philosophy. Yeah. God's philosophy is not that way. But that was mine that I had to overcome. Just, just keep pushing and keep seeing how you can do it another way. Just but instead of accepting that, hey, some things we just don't do. Uh, again, I would say, uh, if it don't go the first time, just get a bigger hammer. But that's not God. God doesn't force anybody to live for Him. Nobody. We do it because we love Him. Thank you, Papa. Okay. Anything else you want to? Well, I'll just say it is as a church and going through this time that we're going through that with this virus. I've never been through anything like this, uh, but by the times that I had of being along with God, being, uh, being just you and God and you developing your spirituality as everybody has to do, I don't care how good they're raised, they've still got to work it out between them and God. During those times, uh, you get your strength, and you realize your strength comes from God. And so as a church, as we're going through what we're going through, uh, we're going to be a stronger church. Let's use this experience to reach out to people, to tell them about the love of God. More people are hearing the gospel preached now probably than any other time. We've been praying, how can we reach them? And outreach, I know uh, I have it, I know the church has. How can we better reach the outreach? And God very seldom does it the way we think he's going to do it. I'm not saying God sent the virus, but God had to allow it to happen. Satan would kill us all if he could, but God allowed it. And more people are hearing the gospel, in my opinion, through the live streaming. And like Pastor Brent preached a fantastic message on Easter. Everybody needs to hear that message. And there's many, many people, no doubt, that heard it. And they'll tell their friends, and they'll go back and look at it yet and see how that God used that to reach many people that would never step inside our doors. Uh, God is using it. Our devotion time, where different people giving devotions, uh, people are, are tuning into that, and people that used to live here are at different ones. So just be faithful to God, and when it's all said and done, uh, to God be the glory. What God did is just put a pause on the world. Well, how I don't know how we're going to get the gospel to them. I didn't know either. And I was praying, seeking God for months, asking for better ways, better methods. And then uh, without me realizing when we got in the middle of this thing, I thought, well, God just may have a sense of humor. He said, I'll show you who's in control here. I'll just allow this virus to come. And he shut down the world, just so to speak. Uh, God is giving people a chance. He loves them so much. He wants them to be saved. And I personally believe that he allowed this to happen.
to bring people to realization they can't depend on the government, they can't depend on their jobs, they can't depend on anything but God. He's the only one, and he says in Hebrews, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now think about the Apostle Paul. He came to God, a persecutor that had persecuted and consented to Stephen being stoned to death and laid his coat to his feet, and how that God, uh, he was sincere, yet wrong, sincerely wrong. But God talked to him and on the way to Damascus and all that happened. But some people just jump across that and say, well, Paul was so brilliant, so great, loved God. He was all that. But he wanted to be sure he was right. And truth will bear investigation. And so in doing so, he came back to Jerusalem after some years and met with Peter and James and some of the leaders of the church just to check it out to be sure that he was on the same gospel as preaching the same gospel. I thought about that. Then I look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, where Paul, and then down to verse 89, where Paul's talking about some people went after another gospel which was not a gospel. He was so disappointed they'd be moved from the truth that go after something that, that was a false after they had known the truth. In verse 8, he said, Though we, Apostle Paul, or the rest of them, so though myself or all the other apostles, preach any other gospel unto you than we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. And verse 9 says almost the same thing. Though an angel from heaven come and preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a curse. God, let God be true to every man a liar. Yes, Apostle Paul is a fantastic man, sacrificed, lived for God, but he's too wanted to be sure that to check with the brethren. And so we need each other. We need each other to bounce off our, our challenges for. And I just would like to say to the church, put God first, always put God first. But remember, God knows everything that you think and you do. The devil don't know that. Don't use reveal and let him know what all you're thinking. But give praise to God. And I love the church. My time here on earth I know is limited. I know I've already gotten old, but I've asked God, let me finish strong. What I mean strong in the faith. Stand for truth and righteousness. So we've got a great church. We've got great leadership and our pastoral staff and the music and all that's involved. So just stay faithful. I'm enjoying the blessings of God. God bless you.